This session's talk will be Restoring Performance, Getting at the Root of the Problem, presented by Dr. Gerald Henry. Dr. Gerald Henry is the Athletic Association Endowed Professor of Environmental Turfgrass Science at the University of Georgia. He earned a bachelor's and master's in plant science and plant biology from Rutgers University and a PhD in crop science from North Carolina State University. He's the director of the Athens Turfgrass Research and Education Center, the undergraduate coordinator for the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, and the director of the UGA Turfgrass Management Program. Please help me welcome Dr. Gerald Henry. All right, everybody hear me okay? Wow, that's loud. All right, so I'm, I'm pretty laid back. Um, so if you have questions, I'd prefer you ask them as we're going through instead of the end. Um, if I can't see you raising your hand, just kind of speak up. Um, just don't throw anything at my face. Unless I'm really bad, and then that'll tell me that I need to, to, to be better. All right, so um, I'm going to kind of bounce around during this presentation. There's going to be some theoretical stuff. Just kind of bear with me here. Uh, and then we'll get into sort of some stuff that we do product testing wise and a few other things um, as we get through the presentation. All right, so um, welcome everyone. Um, so when you look at sports field playability, um, we tend to always be the first ones that are blamed. If you follow Twitter, as soon as a little chunk of your field pops up, boom, your field is bad, you're a horrible manager, you should, you know, you know, rotten and H-E double hockey sticks. Um, you know, unfortunately, inputs for management are usually insufficient unless you're at an extremely high level uh, and usually an afterthought. And I do a lot of work with uh, what we refer to as community level sports fields. So, you know, K through 12, lower end fields, they tend not always to be sand based. A lot of them are soil based. Uh, you've got a lot of issues, a lot of play, you know, unbelievable amounts of play, lots of issues. Um, so I'm not necessarily always working on high-end sports fields. So we all strive for this, whether you have cool season grass or warm season grass. You want a very extensive, healthy root system. You want to, you know, light, you know, white colored roots are always important. Um, and then you want some depth to this. You want this field to hold together. You want to get as many games out of this as possible. So hopefully our former field manager of this facility is not in here. But uh, so this is uh, one of our local high school sports fields, and, and I'll, I'll be honest, uh, this is a horrible situation to be in. Uh, lots of play, uh, field was not constructed properly, lots of you know, issues, and you get a significant amount of rainfall, and, and this is what, what happens, and nobody wants this. Um, and the reason why we got to this point is the school system was just not willing to put any resources into this facility. Uh, and the manager's just left to do what he can, the best he can. And, and obviously he was really doing the best he could. Um, and then this is what happened to us. So, uh, you know, this is my county where I live. They have two high schools. Both football fields were converted to synthetic. Um, you know, after I had been working with them, kind of giving them some pointers and my grad students as well uh, as what to do. And then all of a sudden, they don't have any money to put into the real field, but they came up with you know, $3 million to make two synthetic fields. So go figure. Not saying synthetic is bad, but it would be nice if we could have tried some other options first. So there's lots of reasons for poor rooting, way more than I've got on here. I mean, issues you know, with soil compaction. Um, you may have excessive moisture issues you know, due to various reasons, just maybe poor water infiltration. Uh, inaccurate irrigation systems and so on. Uh, you know, you may have too much nitrogen fertility in the system. Low uh, light conditions are kind of popping up here and there, sort of microclimate scenarios for, for lots of, of fields, regardless of whether you're a big stadium or uh, sort of parks and recs surrounded by a decent amount of trees. Uh, excessive thatch can also cause a problem, and there's tons of other ones we could list as well. So obviously, um, we want to promote lots of cultural practices that enhance root proliferation. I'm not going to really get into a lot of that. Um, I'm going to get into sort of a different side of how to promote root uh, proliferation. But again, making adjustments to your irrigation system, conducting water audits to make sure your systems uh, are operating properly, you know, check them for you know, uh, proper head alignment, uh, you know, functionality, and so on. You know, lots of cultural practices like verticutting and aerification to try and 
um, you know, tend with thatch, try to increase uh, you know, gas exchange in the root system, promote healthy roots, and obviously um, a good fertility program as well. So um, when you look at this picture, uh, the first thing I see, this is I think my youngest, uh, he's a nine-year-old, uh, playing uh, U10 soccer, uh, a complex right down the street from the football field that, that was turned into a synthetic field. Uh, these fields, are held, they hold up you know, relatively well um, you know, with the amount of pressure and play that they're uh, tasked to hold up to, to you know, uh, the amount of play that, that exists on these fields. The first thing you look at, though, when you see this field, and I'm going to kind of get a little deep here, <laughs> is that this is just a monoculture here. So, I mean, you have one grass species, you know, uh, and, and there's not a lot of what we call biodiversity in this system. When you get into something like this, you know, this is a, you know, a forage uh, slash pasture, uh, you know, prairie field, uh, and you see a lot of things going on here. You've got a lot of different flowers, a lot of different, you know, you've got some monocots, lots of different monocots, you've got some dicots, all kinds of things that are going on here. And I don't expect your field to turn into this, but there's lots of things that are going on because of this and lots of things that are going on in response to the fact that you have just a monoculture. And those are some of the reasons that we have issues with poor rooting, um, nutrient availability, and so on. So the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a managed turf grass environment, on the left here, you obviously have what would be considered that prairie field. You know, you're not really mowing or maybe it's mowed, you know, very infrequently, maybe once a year, so on and so forth. Maybe it's burned, I don't know. Um, but you are maintaining a field, whether you're maintaining at a half inch or maybe you're maintaining a grass at, you know, two, two inches or so on, um, depending upon what your species and what the, the actual game that's played. Um, you're going to have less roots than a system that's going to have a lot of above ground canopy. And that's just the way it works. I mean, in order to uh, fuel this big system here, you need a lot of roots below to gather all the water and nutrients that you need. Uh, not as much needed here necessarily, um, but once you start putting athletes on these fields, you're going to need to have as much as possible to make sure that this system holds together and performs well. So as I teach in my classes to my students, mowing is always a stress, um, so you're going to get a reduction of roots in response, uh, sort of an immediate stoppage of root growth just from the plant being wounded, um, and that's just the way it works with physiology of plants. Um, you're going to get a reduction in carbohydrate production, or, uh, a reduction in carbohydrate production and storage. So you're, you know, when you remove, just think of, of as uh, leaf tissue as solar panels. When you start to remove a number of solar panels, you're not collecting as much, um, you know, energy and, and creating that uh, into carbohydrates and being able to store that, and it kind of uh, compounds over time. Obviously, when you wound a plant, you're increasing disease susceptibility. Um, and one of the main things I'll talk about is decreases in plant and microbe interactions. And then in order to kind of keep this system going, you've got to do a lot more. Um, and it's, whenever I talk to somebody about turf grass management, they don't really understand. Look, we're, we've got plants. We're maintaining these plants at, you know, small heights. And we have people play on them. And we're trying to, you know, maintain these fields. It's, it's miraculous that there's green grass at all, let alone the way some of these do perform. So I'll kind of go through, again, you know, when you have reduced roots in response to mowing, and again, when I say reduced, it's just reduced compared to if you weren't mowing at all. Um, you're going to have reduced leachates. So roots are giving off um, basically food for lots of organisms within the soil, um, and they have different functions. And whenever you have reduced food, obviously these guys are not going to be able to survive. They're either going to move. Um, you're going to have less microbial activity. When you have less microbial activity, it means that you are going to have reductions in organic matter degradation, so the breakdown of organic matter, and then obviously nutrient, uh, nutrient mineralization. Um, and again, not always a good scenario. And we sort of forget that we use a lot of these microorganisms um, as natural defenses. You'd be surprised how many microorganisms in the soil are actually providing you with defense against some of these pathogens. So less microbes because of the less roots, Again, 
in theory, is going to equal less defense against pathogens naturally. So when you look at managing turf environments, um, again, some more things as far as less microbial activity and diversity. Come on in. Um, you start to accumulate thatch because, again, you have less organisms to help break down. Um, you tend to rely more on fertilizers because you're having less nitrogen fixed and so on in the soil, less availability of nutrients. Um, and then again, because you have less natural plant defenses, you're relying a lot more on fungicides for disease control. Again, I am not promoting completely organic and, you know, just understand how it's good to kind of use some of the things that are out there to help you in the process. Trust me, we'll get into applying lots of things later. All right, so I try to promote what's called bionutrition. And um, it's basically a four-step process that starts off with revitalizing the soil, and we'll kind of go through these one at a time, uh, repopulating the root zone with microbes, applying appropriate nutrition, which we'll go into pretty substantially, uh, and then what we call connecting the soil with the turf grass. <clears throat> so it's a simple concept, but sometimes it becomes a difficult solution because nothing's ever simple. So when you look at the real turf grass environment, obviously um, we're not typical agronomic situation. You know, if you were uh, a corn farmer, you would plant your corn, eventually it would grow, you would harvest it, you get to start over next year. We don't really get to have that luxury. Some people do, I guess, but not all of us. So we, we do have a perennial system and that means quite a few things. Um, it's a little harder to do some certain management um, uh, scenarios to help us um, because we can't be super aggressive all the time because again, we are constantly having somebody trying to play on our surface. Um, so we have obviously continuous mowing. Um, it's going to be, the frequency is going to depend on the species and the height you're managing. Uh, we all have high expectations, whether you're at the K through 12 level or you're all the way up in the professional uh, scenario. Um, regardless of, of what system you're managing, it's always changing. Uh, we start to have microclimates that pop up and I'll kind of give examples of these at some point. And then cultural practices impact the system quite a bit. Um, they're not always under our control, obviously. Uh, sometimes we have to do things that, that we don't necessarily want to, um, but they're just part of, of the overall management scheme. So again, not to get into golf, but this is a good example. Um, putting greens, you know, when this golf course was, was created, um, they probably had some trees uh, but as it ages, um, you know, these trees are getting larger, they're casting a larger shadow across this green, um, and that's going to change the dynamics. So one of the things that's changed in here is sort of your soil moisture. Um, so the more shade um, is allowing for a lot of that moisture not to be drawn out. Um, you may be retaining. Again, this is probably a USGA spec scenario, but still, uh, there can be situations uh, with moisture retention just due to the shade. You also have a situation where a lot of these plants are probably reaching for light if they're grown in the shade for a certain amount of time. Um, you know, they're going to be sort of light deprived and the first response is to try and increase grow towards the light uh, in order to get uh, more sunlight to go through for more, uh, more photosynthesis and so on. And the drawback of that is that if you're growing too high above ground, then you're losing a lot of your root mass below ground. So we get the same scenarios in sports turf. Um, I apologize if anyone from the Dolphins is in here and I robbed your photograph, but this was a good one. <laughs> um, this is, you know, sometimes what we're dealing with with some of these stadiums. I've been overseas quite a bit and have been in stadiums that have non-retractable roofs that were sort of an afterthought when they put the turf in and then, you know, found out, oh, you know, the sidelines of the stadium are going to be relatively shady for an extended period of time and these grasses need a certain amount of time where they're getting access to not only uh, you know light but quality light. <clears throat> so again kind of going over what I said before highlight intensity um, you know the turf response to light you get horizontal orientation of leaf blades because there's a lot of light present just again think of the solar panels when you're in situations where you have extreme low uh, or no light intensity, um, you may lose the turf outright. But sort of in these moderate shade situations, again, you're going to get that reaching for light um, simply because those plants are trying to survive. 
<clears throat> so again, just kind of what I said before, you know, you get this reaching uh, effect here, and then the response on the root side is that you need to put more uh, of your resources into above ground growth, so you sacrifice some of your root system. In a normal or highlight situation, you know, it's, it's the reverse. So, you know, obviously we're all aware of grow lights and that's one management uh, practice that you can implement. Um, again, that is gonna be at a high level where you can afford those types of things because um, you're able to bring in some of these grow lights to help provide additional light intensity and quality. Again, not always the case when you get down into the lower levels uh, and your budget's pretty thin. Um, we have lots of other uh, microclimates. Um, if I was to ask you which of these three fields uh, football was played on, it's a pretty simplistic answer. It's the one on the left. Um, one of the other things is, is that when you look at this facility, um, field rotation does not seem to be something that's practiced a lot. So again, we start to get, and a lot of times that has nothing to do with the field manager. You're just told these are the fields we're using, they're closer to the bathrooms, and deal with it. Um, you know, but we're starting to create microclimates of soil compaction. So these are maps of soil compaction. The closer to red, the, the more compacted. The closer to blue, the less compacted. So you can see over time, play, again, more microclimates are created. So that's creating lots of variability in your root system. Um, so if you came to a talk that I gave yesterday, we talked a lot about variability. I'm not going to really get too much into that. Um, but a lot of times you can't see some of the variability. You know, if we walked onto a field and there were bare spots, it's easy to tell me, yeah, those are bad areas, those are good areas. Um, but you can't always see the variability that's caused in rooting below ground in response to some of the things that are going on above ground. Unfortunately, you start to see that if you get a lot of traffic and a lot of wear and parts of your field start to come out of the ground. All right, so moving into step number one, revitalizing the soil. So um, one of the things is that continuous use of fertilizers and pesticides can alter the turf grass root zone. So overuse of fertilizers without knowing nutrient status is not a good thing. Um, using fertilizers with a really high salt index can create an issue as well. And I'll get into all these uh, specifics here in a second. And then, unfortunately, all pesticide applications can negatively affect soil microorganisms. I am the last person to tell you that you should stop spraying pesticides because I spray them all day long. Um, what I'm trying to tell you is that you need to be cognizant of the results of you spraying pesticides um, and understand that if you're going to spray something, then you probably want to try to do something to combat the potential damage that may have occurred and then promote some of the activity from some of the microorganisms in the soil. So I'm not going to get into soil testing. Everybody in here understands how that works. But I mean, obviously, the reason we're trying to do this is that you want to try to measure plant available nutrient status, um, use that information to form your fertilizer recommendations. It also gives you an opportunity if you have something that's kind of out of whack. You know, maybe your salinity level is really high and you didn't know it. Um, or, or maybe there's something else that, that's there that's an antagonist or even potential toxicities. So when you look at nutrients in the soil, um, they exist in numerous forms. So they are what we call nutrient pools. You have lots of things that are soluble and lots of things that are insoluble. So soluble just means that they're readily available in the soil solution. Uh, most of the time, the plants can take them up relatively easily. Uh, and then when you look at something that's weakly bound, it's absorbed or adsorbed, easily exchangeable, but available. Strongly bound just means that it's insoluble. So we always talk about soil pH, and there's a reason why we, we try to tell you it's good to be in a soil range you know, of 6 to maybe 6.8. Uh, I mean, you can dabble a little lower. Um, I'm not going to lie. Most of the soils I have to deal with in, in nor, uh, North Georgia, they're going to be around that 5.5, five, 5.6 five, five, range. But the reason why we want you in this sort of sweet spot is that that's when most things are available. So then you don't have to rely on other sources um, necessarily all the time. Um, but when you get a little too high, you get less availability of certain nutrients. And when you get too low, you get less availability, availability of other nutrients. Other things that are going on in the soil, um, this is some work from a grad student I had in my lab. 
that mapped soil pH variability. And I think we all think that when you take a soil sample and it comes back and this is the pH um, that, that you have in your soil, that, um, you know, that's going to be the soil pH of your entire site. And unfortunately, soil pH is extremely variable and it actually changes a lot um, uh, over a short period of time. And I'm kind of talking about the soil that's in close contact with the roots, which is the most important, not necessarily the entire soil. But so this map up here, um, I'm not going to get into. Obviously, you've got a range from about 5.1 to 6. But you can see that there's a lot of variability. This is obviously some golf course work. This is a fairway. Um, this is a device called the Varus that we were mapping with. Um, but this is just kind of showing you the variability of the soil uh, with respect to not an extremely large area. Um, so again, um, in some of these areas, you're going to have more availability of nutrients. In other areas, you're going to have less availability of nutrients. Yes, sir. Um, not to get off topic too much, but speaking of variability, is it changing not just from this side to this side, but also time of year? Is that affecting? <clears throat> With respect to pH and, and if so, or anything? Well, We, we don't really suggest an optimal time. We just tell you to be consistent with the time from year to year. So as long as you're somewhat consistent with when you take your soil sample. So if you take something, you know, early spring, then next year you shouldn't be taking samples in late summer. It just uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, so sometimes people, they need to take samples earlier just simply because of, you know, purchasing material ahead of time. Um, but just we just tell people to be consistent at the time of year, from year to year. We don't, I don't really have a sweet spot of when you should take a sample. It really depends on, you know, when you can get out there. So again, um, the area that means the most is probably the area that exists the least. So the area that is going to interact with organisms um, and your plants is what we call the rhizosphere. So it's this region of soil um, it's influenced by the roots and the soil microorganisms, and it's going to play the most critical role in the availability um, of nutrients and uptake. And a lot of times it can be somewhat difficult to manipulate soil pH relatively quick, um, but you'll see as I get through some of this stuff, soil pH is manipulated um, you know, by the system quite a bit. Um, and you can do certain things that can make massive changes in soil pH in close proximity to the plant. Again, not talking about all the soil. So this is some work or some data uh, or a slide, I guess, that I stole from a colleague, Lane Treadway, uh, who works for Syngenta now. He was at uh, North Carolina State University. Um, and this had more to do with uh, disease management, management and the disease spring dead spot, but it kind of rings true with everything. So. Your nitrogen source is going to influence the soil pH. Um, so spring dead spot is uh, prolific in high soil pHs. But then you think to yourself, well, you know, he was doing this work at North Carolina State. In North Carolina, they don't have really high soil pHs. But you can have a really high soil pH that surrounds your roots, but the sort of, I guess, ambient soil pH is just, you know, normal, maybe 6 or 6.5. When I was out in West Texas, when I was at Texas Tech, it was completely common to have a soil pH that was 8.0 and higher um, all the time. Um, so again, you know, that was a situation I couldn't manipulate too much, but your nitrogen source is going to influence the soil pH. So calcium nitrate, again, not telling you not to use them or use them, but calcium nitrate increases soil pH, whereas the ammonium sulfate reduces it. And it's just based off of what's um, absorbed and what is uh, released into the soil and how it affects the, the, the pH right around the roots and the root hairs. So really the sulfate and the calcium within these materials doesn't have much of an, an effect on the soil pH. So just be cognizant sometimes of the type of materials that you're using and how it may, again, influence some of these pHs. When you use a lot of high salt index fertilizers um, over time, to, again, it depends on the system. If you're in a sand-based system and you pump out a ton of irrigation, probably not. But uh, you can increase the salinity level of your soil. So 
This may require you to flush uh, salts from the soil. Again, if your uh, sodium to calcium index is greater than five, um, the easiest, cheapest way to do this is just to water. Um, even if your water source is extremely, uh, has a lot of uh, salinity in it, um, you can still get away with it. We used to do this in West Texas where we had lots of salt in the water. Um, if you put a lot of water out there, you're going to eventually push it all through the system, even if your, your water is highly saline. Um, you can go through other programs. Um, there's lots of flush programs out there. Most of these flush programs are designed for use on USGA spec situations. So again, we've done some testing with that. Most of them work relatively well, but as soon as you get into a native soil situation, it's really tough to make most of these flush programs work. So a lot of them will have uh, humid fulvic materials, uh, some soluble calcium products, some wetting agents, soil penetrants. Um, again, just cater what you're doing to the soil type that you have. So encouraging microbial activity, again, understanding fungicides and herbicides, you know, some control beneficial fungi that help with nutrient availability. Um, you want to utilize cultural methods to reduce pests prior to use so that you use potentially less pesticides um, and you're doing less harm to the beneficials in the system. <clears throat> All right, step two, repopulate with microbes. So you want to try to stimulate local populations. Uh, you also want to try to potentially apply microbial inoculants. And I think as soon as I say that, most people kind of get scared and go, oh, God, I don't want to have to start brewing some stinky substance in the corner and making applications of that. The technology is kind of gone past that, and I'll kind of explain some of that as we go along. But so this is where we start to get into the phrase biosimulants, and they tend to fit into the management program. So biostimulants are substances. They can also be microorganisms that stimulate existing biological chemical processes in the plants. And it can also be associated with microbes within the soil. Typically, they do not contain nutrients or many nutrients. However, when you buy a product, it may have the addition of nutrients, and that's where it gets difficult to determine if the product you're buying is really working or if it's just the nutrients within the product that's actually causing the the change, and I'll touch on that too. Again, I'm not promoting any person's products, I'm just kind of show you what I've seen. Um, and just because I see it work doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else is going to see it work. <clears throat> All right, so four major categories of biostimulants. Some of these you probably have heard of, some of them you're, you're probably scratching your head. Um, I don't tend to use and, and work with all of these, but microbial inoculants could be uh, free living uh, fungi. Um, uh, anything from other fungi to bacteria, um, protein, pro, ugh, protein hydrolysates, and amino acids are probably the newest hot topic. Uh, a lot of people making applications of these materials. I haven't used a whole lot of these. Um, I've done a lot of work with humic uh, substances. I think Dr. Tomes gave a talk earlier on humic uh, materials. So it could be anything from humic acid to fulvic acid and then seaweed extracts which a lot of times they're going to be used in combination with humic and fulvic acid as sort of a combo product. So some of the benefits, obviously, of biostimulants is they enhance turf grass growth, uh, indoor quality by improving nutrient uptake, nutrient use efficiency, uh, indoor tolerance to abiotic stress, anything from heat to drought to saline soils. This is a little experiment that we ran with um, uh, some students in the, the little pot on the right here had several doses of a biostimulant that we were testing. They were exposed to 110 degree temperature, and again, this plant eventually did die, but it did last about a week and a half longer than the other two that are crispy critters right here on the left in the middle. So not a silver bullet, but it can help you in a crunch. Again, sometimes it's really hard to predict when bad things are going to happen, so it's really hard to predict when to apply these you know, before bad things happen. So again, there's a lot of uh, uh, ifs here. <clears throat> All right, so again, moving into a stimulate local micro population. So anything you can do to improve their food source, uh, stabilize their environment. I will say improving the food source of beneficial microorganisms can also improve the food source of pathogenic microorganisms. So watch what you apply and how you apply it because you can also stimulate the bad guys. And then you end up with an outbreak that you end up having to spray a ton of fungicides on anyway. So um, kind of keep that in mind. 
but really trying to stabilize their environment is, is, I guess, where I come from. Understand what you're doing and how it affects them and how you can kind of promote them on the tail end. So again, looking at microbial inoculants, bacteria, fungi, um, aiding in nutrient mineralization and pest control, um, applied as seed treatments or liquid applications. The key here is consistency. Um, I would say maybe 10 years ago, uh, it was really hard to promote microbial materials um, or, or most biostimulants in general, just because a lot of the, the products had no research behind them. Um, they didn't have a lot of money to provide research, and it was just you're taking the company's word um, for it, and, and that's kind of difficult at times. Recently, there's a lot of large seed and chemical companies that have purchased a lot of these uh, smaller microbial firms um, and have pumped a lot more money into the research and development, and therefore the, the products have gotten better. And again, that consistency is, is starting to increase, um, and that's really the key. You don't want a product that works one time, then you use it again you know, next year, and it doesn't work at all, and you can't figure out why. Well, they changed the source and all kinds of other things, and you don't want that to happen. So we're, we're kind of getting away from, you know, hey, you know, I've had people run up uh, on top of me at golf courses with random jugs of, of brown liquids. Can you test this for me? Whoa, get back. I don't even know who you are. Um, you know, no more brewing things in your bathroom tub, you know. <clears throat> so um, this is just kind of how we started. I, uh, I got into uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria um, sort of as a whim. I had a student that approached me and said, hey, you know, I think this is an interesting topic. Can I do a little project with you? Sure, why not? You know, I'll laugh at you in the end when it doesn't work. But uh, that unfortunately was not the case. Although I say we got involved with a product that is um, genetically modified, so it is, uh, not to get too much into it, the negative feedback loop for nitrogen fixation has been removed from this specific bacteria. So it doesn't ever get to a point where um, the pool of, of you know, is, is sort of flush. So it's constantly fixing nitrogen bacteria, uh, or it's constantly fixing nitrogen, um, and, and it's never sort of stopping. Um, We've done some environmental work. That's not a big factor, um, but um, it is pretty interesting. So really quick, this is perennial ryegrass roots, and this is growing from seed. Uh, so this is three weeks after seeding. Again, these are small numbers, but keep in mind that we're dealing with small pots in the greenhouse, and, and they don't weigh a whole lot. But so we saw a 2.3 to a 6.5x uh, increase in rooting in response to this nitrogen-fixing bacteria. I apologize for the blue on blue. I don't think that was the color originally. Um, fertilizer alone, you know, less than half of that. Again, non-treated check here on the left. Uh, you can see that um, it's, uh, it's not producing uh, many roots at all. And then a combo of the bacteria plus the fertilizer is pretty similar to the bacteria by itself. So we, we got pretty excited about this, and this spurred lots of other projects in our, our group. Um, just to kind of give you a little picture here, one of the bacteria-treated pots. This is how many roots. So we get really technical. We float these roots out in a tray. We run it through a scanner, and I can tell you the total root length and uh, so on. I can zoom in and tell you root hair production and, and all these other fun things. And then this is the non-treated here on the right. You can see the increase in mass in response to the product. So uh, we did a lot of microbial product comparison research. Um, we looked at uh, the new Sahara 2. Uh, common Bermuda grass in the greenhouse. Uh, some treatments received a sequential application four weeks after. Uh, a lot of these materials, and it depends on the material you're using. So with this, I'm not going to show you the companies we worked with. Uh, some of them were products that I acquired. Um, I don't want to say illegally, but <laughs> without the, the uh, uh, certain people being aware, because a lot of people get scared when you start to look at their products. Um, but the carrier volumes can be as low as 80 gallons per acre, which is not really low, and as high as 320 gallons per acre. So that's another kind of drawback. It's really hard to start pumping out 320 gallons per acre on a field. Um, again, another limitation. Um, so the treatments consisted of what we have for that were three commercially available products on the market right now. Um, one's only commercially available for agronomics, but it's being moved into turf grass. And then one was an experimental. So again, this is just kind of looking at root weight uh, six weeks after seeding. Um, lots of treatments down here. Really just what I want to show is 
not a whole lot of differences with the root weights regardless of the product. Uh, we had um, some that helped a little, but when the check is right here and the only ones that are doing better are right here, that's nothing to write home about. So again, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work. Uh, shoot weight, um, again, check on the far left. You know, a couple of these treatments have a little bit of increase, but uh, not something that I would be too excited about. And really during initial establishment, I'm not really trying to push a lot of above ground shoot weight anyway. I just want it to be somewhat normal. So when you look back at microbial inoculants, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's minimal regulations. Uh, <laughs> I like to say there's no guarantees. Uh, every time I have, I don't want to say complained, but have commented that something hasn't worked, I'm usually told that I'm not doing it right and it's operator error. Um, so, but, uh, so I guess there isn't, there are no guarantees. But again, as, as some of these products are picked up by larger companies, obviously they're, they're going to stand by their product. Um, you know, they are hard to survive under adverse weather. Um, a lot of their activity decreases as soil temperatures reach about 80, 81, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, when you get into dry situations, low soil moisture, you know, it can be antagonistic to them. You can have a lot of antagonism from existing soil mo microbes. So if you're working with a company or buying a product that is created, you know, overseas in, in their conditions and then it's brought here uh, and you throw a bunch of microorganisms that are not native into the mix and there's something there that's been living there for, you know, 10, 20 years that's used to the environment, it is going to outcompete that thing really quick. So a lot of times in order to get some of this stuff to work, we're making three, four, five applications before we can build up enough population where it can actually have an effect. So again, keep that uh, in the back of your mind as well. Mixing can definitely um, be messy. Application can be messy. Um, some products are, are just freeze dried, so it makes it really simplistic. You just activate them and spray them. Others, they want you to sort of uh, uh, brew them, I guess, uh, over a lengthy period of time. Again, that creates more headache with having to store something on site and having some more equipment. Um, I will say we see way more um, success with cool season grasses uh, than warm season, and obviously we see a lot more success in the greenhouse than we see in the field. In the greenhouse, they don't have any competitors. In the field, they've got lots of competitors. So. <clears throat> There's a lot more we don't know. Uh, most of the work we do uh, leads to more questions than answers. So a little hard to see, but there are some mixing concerns. Um, this is one product that we can get to mix pretty uniform. And this is a product here that's got some chunky floaties and some stuff that settles on the bottom and I can't get it to go in the solution. So that's not going to spray very easy. It's going to clog a nozzle and you're going to have to deal with that down the road. So. A lot of them are not compatible with, with other products. You really have to pay attention to what you're, you're dealing with. Uh, just to kind of run through some of the research that we've done. Um, and for me, I like to do a lot of work on active fields. So I don't want to put uh, a lot of research on a field that I'm maintaining that nobody's playing on and you know it's, a, it's an amazing field and I can't really see any differences. I want to put my stuff on a field that's getting obliterated <laughs> so I can see how things are holding up and how they affect the plant. So this was one trial that we put on an athletic field. Again, this is a native soil um, looking at uh, 419 hybrid Bermuda grass. We always compare everything to urea because it's a product that everybody uses. It's cheap, um, easy to get a hold of. Um, I'll kind of give you my ideas on urea at some point um, that you may agree or disagree with. Again, not promoting anybody's products, but we looked at some stuff from Earthworks, um, some humic acid, molasses, cult materials, and they've got some claims about proliferation of organisms and relief of compacted soils. I'll give you my take on that as well with any product. So uh, kind of going back to the humic substances, um, natural source of rooting hormone derived from the decomposition of plants and animals, um, comprised 60 to 80 percent organic matter. They are the most resistant component of organic matter to microbial decomposition. Lots of sources out there. Again, the key is, uh, is to have a consistent source, and a lot of these companies do that, that um, uh, a lot of the newer companies anyway. 
So potential benefits of humic substances is basically increased photosynthesis and root growth. Um, you know, everything for me with trying to hold a field together is really revolving around root growth, root mass, and root depth. So anything you can get to enhance that is what we're going for. So just some preliminary work before I get into uh, that project. Um, this is some stuff we did in the greenhouse, which is the reason why we put things into the field. Um, so this was Bermuda grass in the greenhouse, and I'm not going to tell you these treatments because they don't align with all the ones I said before. Um, but obviously the non-treated check here, you can see not as many roots. Um, and then these other four plugs here, and these are pretty big, they're about cup cutter size. Um, you can see the root mass and the root length depth here in response to some of these other treatments is significantly better than the non-treated chick. Again, this doesn't happen every single time. It really depends on uh, you know, some outlying factors as well. So like I said, we do a lot of work in situ. So you know, we work hand in hand with UGA Rec Sports. Um, they utilize just a few fields for several sports. Um, so it's everything from men's and women's, rugby, lacrosse, soccer, ultimate frisbee. So when you have a field that's used for rugby, that's also used for lacrosse and ultimate frisbee, it usually means that the whole field <laughs> is pretty beat up. So um, this is just what it looks like after one day. So you can see all the torn up plants. And by the time we're you know a month, month and a half into the season, um, it's rough. So uh, just like any, <laughs> any facility, uh, they actually have about a dozen fields and they only use two. Uh, they don't tend to listen, um, but again, these are the closest fields to the parking lot because you really wouldn't want anybody who's playing a sport to walk a little before they play the sport. I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense to me, but it is what it is. All right, so uh, I have the luxury of, of, of equipment that kind of gives me uh, precise data very quickly. Uh, so this is uh, the Precision Sense 6000, so a lot of the, the research I show uh, may have some maps, some of it may not, but we can get data very quickly over an entire area so we can make larger plot sizes, which is cool because it's really hard to determine if something works in a 5 by 5 foot square. I can start making plots that are 20 feet by 40 feet and so on and so forth. Um, so if anyone, this gives us soil moisture data, compaction, uh, plant health through NDVI, all kinds of other things. And we can generate these maps. So this is a map generated over top of a study that I had. I'm not alluding to just showing you that this is some of the stuff we can generate from this equipment. All right, so the previous study that I outlined with that humic material, um, this is 28 days, so about a month after we started the trial. So we're comparing a non-treated check on the left, a urea here in yellow, uh, second to left. And the urea had two applications here, at trial initiation and then three weeks after. So this is three weeks of, uh, of uh, two applications of this product. The others were just applied uh, at the initiation of the trial. So again, this is only a month in, but we were able to, obviously you can see we're increasing. Uh, this is increase in soil compaction, not soil compaction. So this is starting from zero, technically. This is how much compaction um, we gained in, in response to all of these treatments. Um, so just keep that in mind. So we had less increase in compaction with some of these treatments compared to a straight up urea fertilizer and a non-treated jig. And the reason behind that, at least I think it is, is because we're actually stimulating root growth in response to these treatments, which could be fracturing the soil at really micro events, which could sort of hold off compaction a little bit more. Um, then we lost roots in the non-treated check and even in the urea, and I'll kind of talk about this as I go along. Even in, with urea, if you're on a straight urea program, it pushes too much above ground um, canopy and it doesn't really do a whole lot for your root system. So if you're straight urea all the time, I can show you some pictures of plants that we started with urea and they're like a year or two years old. It's a little disheartening <laughs> to look at. So I'm all for urea, but just don't use only urea, if that makes sense. But again, so we think it's because of the increase in rooting uh, that, that helped with that uh, um, alleviation, I guess, of some of the soil compaction. 
So again, one study, um, you know, we're constantly doing more studies, but um, just one good benefit that we saw from one of these trials. Um, another area that I've kind of gone into, not that I wanted to, but I was sort of shoved into this arena um, because there were a lot of questions, um, is the liquid aeration arena. Um, anyone use liquid aeration products? No one's willing to raise their hand. Anyone heard of liquid aeration products? All right. Um, so again, some common materials here that we've used in other products. Um, but again, I don't know the background of some of these materials and the quality. Some of them also contain, um, I'd say there's probably about a dozen liquid aeration products on the market. Some also contain beneficial microorganisms and they also contain nutrients. So it's again, really hard to decipher, are they working um, because of the products that you claim are in here doing the job or is it something else? So I'm not gonna read this claim, but basically what this is trying to tell you is you know, you don't ever have to core aerify again. This product's going to help you. And a lot of their stuff is geared towards home lawns, and I get that. Um, but they are moving a lot of these products into sports fields because they see dollar signs. And um, it's, uh, it's a little scary. <laughs> um, so this is, again, change in soil compaction. Uh, this is a liquid aeration product applied twice. Uh, a liquid aeration product uh, plus fer uh, a fertilizer applied twice. Um, I want to say the fertilizer is just a typical starter fertilizer or maintenance fertilizer. Uh, the fertilizer uh, alone applied twice, core aerification, and a non-treated check. So this is a month after we started the trial, and this is change in soil compaction in uh, pounds per square inch. All of the treatments with the liquid aeration and the fertilizer alone had a larger increase in soil compaction, more than the non-treated check, and here's your core aerification, we had a decrease in, in soil compaction. And this is a month after the event, so that's actually pretty cool, because if this was a week after, that yellow bar would be below the screen. Um, so again, we're not seeing this um, equal to that. So again, we looked at change in root weight. Um, so this is way down the end of the study. Um, and core aerification still giving us a good increase in root weight. One core aerification 112 days before this was taken, the data was taken. Uh, this liquid aeration product, um, this is actually, I think at this point, it's four times. Uh, and then plus the fertilizer and then fertilizer alone, you know, we had the fertilizer kind of helping out with some, some uh, uh, rooting increase, <clears throat> uh, kind of doing the heavy lifting in response to the combination there. And then obviously if you don't use any fertilizer, it's kind of hard uh, to maintain some roots long term. So again, you know, one core aerification event, if that's all you're able to do, uh, is equivalent to um, or actually better than applying this material. Again, this should be four times, not two times. All right, real quick on aerification, since we did this work uh, a while back and some of you in this audience may have helped us inadvertently, um, we had a survey in 2013. We wanted to know what the most widely used aerification device was and 47% of the respondents, I wanna say we had like 120 or 150 respondents, something like that, it was a pretty good response. But almost 50% of you said you use open spoon aerification. And I get that that may be the only option you have, but I hate to tell you this, but we, we performed some research, uh, long-term, two-year study, where we looked at no aerification, aerifying one, two, three, or four times a year over two years, and we saw no differences between aerifying four times a year um, compared to doing nothing over two years using open spoon. And it makes sense because of how open spoon works. I'm not sure if I have slides in here, but so with a core aerifier, I mean, you have a gear driven mechanism that is slamming into the ground and is basically pulling a larger core and it's causing fracturing through the soil. With an open spoon, it just works on the weight of the drum and it's pulling a small core out and you're just not getting that fracturing. So um, you really don't get as much of 
uh, of a benefit from that as you would hope. Um, not saying don't do it, but if it's your only option, um, I wouldn't waste going out there a lot of times. Uh, I would probably do it infrequently. And hopefully you can get some other option in there as well. All right, so more on biostimulant effect on rooting and soil compaction. Some more work done on those same fields, uh, same setup, but we're comparing urea this time uh, to sort of a, a plethora of different things uh, from different uh, nitrogen sources to other um, uh, macro micronutrients and then a wetting agent here. And in this study, we're using a shear vein to look at shear strength. And what we were looking at, again, long-term study, this is 14 weeks, um, so you know, over three, three and a half months. And we try to keep a minimal acceptable level of shear strength at 10 um, Newton meters. And this is, again, long-term trial, so this combination of materials, uh, so this could be a fertilizer slash microbial, well, slash biostimulant product. Um, Compared to the non-treated check, uh, you know, we, uh, we were unable to maintain that level of shear strength. And then urea at two different rates applied numerous times throughout the season. Uh, again, we're not able to maintain that shear strength. Um, we do a lot of work with wetting agents uh, and looking at, obviously this is a putting green, but we do some work in sports fields too. Putting greens are easier just because uh, the, the grass is shorter. Um, looking at rooting depth, um, so, again, all wetting agents that we've tested in the past, and some of them vary, not going to get into specific products, but we have seen an increase in rooting depth. Again, this is in millimeters, um, but over time this does equate to a pretty decent amount of increase. Non-treated check on the right, comparing that with the other four, regardless of which wetting agent we used, we saw a significant increase in rooting depth, um, and that kind of makes sense. A lot of these materials are um, making the soil moisture uh, within the soil more uniform and it's allowing the roots to grow a little deeper or mine for the soil uh, a little deeper in the profile. Um, obviously, I'm sure we're all aware of wetting agents, but using them to increase the uniformity of soil moisture, retain soil moisture deeper in the soil profile, but we were also looking at decreasing fertility uh, leaching, um, which may increase length of availability uh, in the in the soil. So we do a lot of different things uh, in the greenhouse. It's one of my former grad students who's now at Texas A&M and my technician Kevin here on the bottom right. Um, this again was all the wetting agents that we tested compared to fertilizer alone. So all of these treatments received fertilizer and then they also received a wetting agent. And then this is just fertilizer alone on the right and you can see that what we're doing is we're monitoring for leaching of total nitrogen over time. So we catch 24 seven, um, you know, over a two month or three month period. Um, so this is four weeks after treatment. So this is about a month. And you can see we had less nitrogen leaching in response to every single wetting agent we tested compared to the, the uh, non-treated check. And this may help with rooting depth uh, if the materials are around longer um, they have more access to it. It can help with the system overall. Um, so again, sort of an environmental benefit to using some of these wetting agents. <clears throat> Moving into some new PGR technology, I've worked a lot with Gluco Pro. I will not attempt to um, say that right now because uh, we could be here another 10 minutes. Um, so what this does, this is not like a typical PGR that you've probably interacted with. This is going to unlock and release glucose bound uh, that is bound to lectin proteins within the plants. Um, they are typically found in high concentrations in plant roots. And the release of this, these glucose uh, uh, materials provides a flush of energy that fuels lots of biological functions. And uh, long term, what it does is um, it's like steroids for your root system. So this is just kind of a, a picture of some of the data uh, or some of the plants that we pulled out of the research uh, trial. So on the left, non-treated, you know, pretty decent root system. Urea, one thing you can notice here is it's really dark colored. The roots are not very healthy in response to just a urea diet. So again, I try to persuade people to add some other things into their program. But these are um, 
three different rates of urea plus glucopro, so you can see the combination of adding something into the program. Um, you can see the amount of roots we're growing in response here with the glucopro, and this is another experimental on the right. <coughs> of course, I'm going to start coughing now. All right, step three, apply appropriate nutrition. So you want to apply fertility only after a soil test is conducted. Did I just go out? And um, is it all right? For some reason, it's in like it wasn't working. <clears throat> um, you want to use what we call biorational fertilizers. Um, so again, not synonymous with organic. Um, basically, they're synergistic with beneficial organisms. They tend to feed or at least not kill microbes that in turn will enhance your turf grass uh, growth. Um, so this is where we call biofertilizers. Um, this is where they fit into the management program. So biofertilizers are anything made from previously living plants or animals. Uh, they can be grouped by how much they are processed or decomposed. And again, a lot of these products are hard to use because of the fact <coughs> that you want somebody to play on this system um, and not uh, wallow around in a bunch of compost. But the last one on here, the biodigestates, are kind of a new area that are, that are popping up. Um, and biodigestate simply means that it's material that remains after anaerobic digestion of a biodegradable feedstock. So these are heavily processed materials that are a little easier to apply, and they're not like manures and compost. So some of the potential benefits, obviously, supply nutrients um, in a form that's directly absorbed by the plants, or at least it's in a form that's quickly decomposed to available forms, hoping to increase turf grass growth and quality. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into this, but this is sort of how the process works uh, with anaerobic digestion. Um, Biofertilizers bio are produced th through the process of anaerobic digestion, and it can be uh, uh, a group of different products that are then further processed and uh, creating a product on the tail end that you can utilize. Um, so an example here um, is sort of like you know waste material, food waste, and how it's turned into um, some of these uh, biofertilizers. So step four, connect the soil with the plants. Environmental stress disrupts plant metabolism. This weakens plant growth, reduces root exudates. Again, the food that is essential for these microbes to survive uh, and actually do the functions that they're um, supposed to do uh, that are hopefully beneficial. Um, so this is where, again, we start to put biostimulants back into the program that are utilized to combat some of these issues. Again, it's very difficult to determine when you're going to have a stress that pops up. Um, and obviously, the product has to be applied well before the stress occurs. So. Either you're kind of all in on some of these materials uh, or, you know, you're probably going to miss the window of opportunity. So just kind of talking about one of the, the areas I had alluded to earlier, the protein, hydrolysates, and amino acids, um, looking at potential benefits, stimulation of plant microbiomes. Um, again, substrates such as amino acids can provide a food source for plant-associated microbes that help the turf acquire nutrients in water, um, especially during um, biotic and abiotic stress events. So this is uh, a trial that we put out. Uh, again, this is a putting green, so bear with me. Um, a little hard to see, but so we, we do a lot of research in conjunction with um, field managers, superintendents, and so on. And this is a trial we had out on a nursery green, and uh, the irrigation on the green broke. And this is probably a month after um, we had made a lot of these applications. Uh, and um, it was on a Friday, I think, that the irrigation shut down. And nobody had looked at the nursery green over the weekend. So we came in Monday and saw that the green was predominantly dead, except for a couple of, of rectangles that we had sprayed some of these materials on. So this ended up turning into a product that's on the market now. I won't tell you which one. but. Uh, uh, you can see that some of these products do help uh, under stress events um, if the plant has been acclimated, um, you know, at least a few weeks or so in advance. Um, I try to promote this with everybody. I mean, 
if you ever want to test something, and it's not doesn't have to be something I talked about, but if it's an, a fungicide or an herbicide or whatever, I mean, you can be your own scientist. Um, you know, it's hard for me to get up here and say, hey, I saw this, so therefore, you know, this is going to happen for you, because you all have different environments. Um, you know, it could be anything from different soil types to different water quality and so on. Um, so you really should test the product even if someone says, hey, this is going to work. You know, test it at your facility because it's under your management practices. Um, it's within your climate and your environment. You know, I'm testing products sometimes in, in the summertime, you know, we're pushing 95, 100 degrees. I mean, you may be in a situation where you don't even, you know, even approach those temperatures. So it, it's a totally different scenario for everybody in this room. Um, my best advice would be to locate a small test area, you know, with similar characteristics as the areas that you want to use the products on in the future. Don't go off to a non-play area that doesn't have the same soil type, it's not maintained, and spray this and say, oh, wow, look at that, because that's not the system that you're about to spray it on. So try to pick a small area of your field or your complex uh, and do a little investigation on your own. Look at the materials in the product. Does it make sense to you? You know, if someone has a ton of nitrogen in this product and they're claiming that the product, the other ingredients are creating benefits like, you know, increased green color and all these other things, well, that's not coming from the product. It's coming from the nitrogen that's in the product. Um, again, if you're going to test a single product, don't tank mix it with something else because it's, again, really hard to determine which one is, is, um, is giving you uh, the beneficial effect. Um, I see a lot of people who do this on, on Twitter, um, probably more on the golf side than any, but um, just to kind of, not to get in the hardcore science here, but a demo plot really isn't enough. It will give you a little bit of information, but the true way is if you put a couple out, you know, replicate it. You know, if you put four plots out and all four look good, then you know, hey, maybe I got something here. If you just put one plot out, I mean, it could just be the luck of the draw that you put it in the right spot. Um, so the demo plot theory, as much as I applaud any data that you can generate, is good. It's not necessarily enough, um, in my mind, to, uh, to determine whether I want to use something or not. So try to replicate, and you don't have to make big spots. I mean, a five by five foot spot um, is usually good enough to give you an idea of whether something is working or not. Compare it to some other stuff that you normally use as well. All right, so I, I withheld from speaking about Georgia, but I'll leave you with that one. Um, we are very happy about winning a national championship. It helps me a lot out too, so um, they're usually a lot more friendly to talk to when they're winning championships. Um, I guess I'll take any questions at this time. If you don't want to ask me now, you can email me. I'm pretty good at getting back to emails. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm not really huge on Twitter as far as posting a lot of stuff, but we do post some of our research on there and some of the stuff my grad students are doing if you want to follow us. And uh, I appreciate the time, but if anyone has any questions, I'll take them. I'll try to answer them. Yes, sir? Yeah. Say I start a, a routine of biostimulants applications. Do you, do you stick with one or do you try to look at it as epidemiology? I don't think you'll – well, it really depends on what you're dealing with. Um, I think if you go, if you bounce from one to the, the to the next, it's hard to determine what's working, what isn't. I mean, if in my opinion, if you're going to try something, I would try it for a couple of years because as you go from one year to the next, I mean, like in Georgia now, when I first got to Georgia, we were averaging maybe 40 inches of rainfall a year. The last three years, we've had over 80 inches in my area. That is a huge difference. So I would give a product at least two years. Um, if you want to combo products, I would test them separately first to figure out what's actually working. There's no point in spending money on something that doesn't do anything. And I, I don't laugh, but I, I, maybe I get more annoyed when someone tells me, well, I'm, I'm using products A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I'm like, well, why are you using these? Oh, well, you know, this does this, this does that, this does this. And I'm like, are you sure about that? And, and sometimes it's like going to the doctor. They give you all these different medications, and some of them may not even do anything, but they're I don't want to say they're selling it to you anyway, but um, it's, it's common sense. Like, but I, I don't think if you – I wouldn't be afraid to, um, to combo some things. I don't think anything's too different that's going to tip the scales in favor uh, of you know, one microorganism over another. But 
keep in mind if it's a microbial product, you're better off with locally. <laughs> uh, products that were created locally, I guess, than, than, than some of the foreign ones because um, they have a better chance of surviving or you're going to have to put a lot more out over a length, lengthier period of time. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I'm not familiar with open spoon. Okay. Uh, but it sounds like if you don't get depth, is that a major concern where you won't see any results with the airification? I think it's a combo of the depth and the force because pulling the core because um, you know, with a, a normal core airifier, um, you have that hydraulic push into the ground. Not only does it grab the core and pull it out, but it's fracturing below that. We've done all kinds of weird stuff with airification. Varying your depth is good too, because you can actually create a plow pan underneath if you go to the same depth over time. Every time, it's just like plowing a field. Um, so varying your, your techniques are good too, but open spoons, just there's not enough weight involved. So it's, it's sort of like a drum that looks like a spiker, but there's these small, for, sake, for lack of a better phrase, open little spoon that kind of just goes in the ground and flicks out a core. The cores are maybe an inch. I've seen some that are a little deeper, some that are more shallow. It, you can move a lot faster than a typical core air fryer. Yes, sir? On that note, did you, did you look at what you just described as similar to what I have? Okay. I probably get four inches on if it's a little moist. Did you look at any other, like, as opposed to, what's, what's the one? I was trying to think of the name. There's a lot that go in and... Uh, no, we, we just wanted to look at that because we wanted to investigate the most widely used device. So these plots were huge, too, so it becomes really difficult when you have... You know, no airification. I think these plots were like 20 by 60 foot lanes. And then when you have four or five treatments and then you replicate those four or five times, I mean, we, I think we used two different fields to do this one study. So you add another treatment and it makes it even larger. So we were trying to confine, confine everything to a, a smaller space. But no, it was just open spoon at either no, no airification one time a year, two, three, and four spaced out through the growing season, and then did that over two years. Do you look at any other types of areas at, no. for that stuff? There's some research out there on things like the shock wave um, and a few other things that have recently come out, but um, I haven't personally, no. Okay. Usually from what I see, airification, regardless of what it is, will have a positive effect, but that effect does not last really long. Um, a couple weeks at tops, um, there are some benefits that last longer, but the compaction alleviation tends not to last very long in a native soil. Somebody else had a yes, sir. Are you get a ring? I asked, man. They kind of snubbed me. <laughs> all I said, all I did was I text the AD and I said, hey, so just let me know when you need my ring size. And he said, ha ha ha. I'll think about it. And then the next day he goes, yeah, not gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah. I think I actually help keep the hedges alive more than anything, though. So I've, had, I've given more advice to hedges than the field. But we've got a good field manager. He does a great job. So Plus, if he doesn't, we just replace the field every year, which is what we end up doing anyway, against our wishes, mine and the field manager's. Any other questions?